group, but we'll go ahead and get started, and as others come in, we'll let them catch up. But uh, to make sure we get the most out of your time, we'll get started, hopefully, as quickly as we can. So anyway, I'd like to introduce Dr. Michael Albanese. He's here with us again, and he's going to be presenting about the Lifestyle Makeover, Part 1. Uh, part 2 we will have in the beginning of November, so um, please try to come to that as well, so you can get the most out of both of these presentations. And without further ado, I'll turn it over to Dr. Albanese. Thank you. Okay, I think I'm on. <laughs> well, welcome. That's loud. Am I okay? All right. Well, as Jay mentioned, this is a two-part workshop. So today, maybe I'll bring this down a little bit. Is that a little better? There we go. Okay, uh, this is a two-part workshop. So the reason why we broke this down into two parts is mainly because there's so much information. So today we're gonna cover some information and the reason why we do this uh, first workshop and then the second one about a month from now. So if we start to freak everyone out about the information, you can go without food for 40 days. So between now and next time you'll be okay and then you'll recover with the information that we're going to uh, share with you next time. So you'll be all right. So. Uh, the reason why I started this workshop in particular was I get a lot of questions, especially around the end of the year, the beginning of the year in January, because we all know what happens. Everything changes in January, my whole life, right? We just wonder what happens in August when we look back and say, wait, what happened to that person that was going to be in January? So I started noticing people would ask me questions about diet. Everyone wants to go on a diet and exercise. Those are like the two big, you know, goals that people have in January. So people would come up to me and they would say, you know, let's sit down and, and talk a little bit about our, my diet, how I can formulate a better diet. I want to lose X amount of weight and things like that. So we would do that. And I started realizing that people were making what they thought were healthier choices in terms of their diet. You know, I'm eating low fat this, I'm eating, eating all natural this. And that's great. But what they didn't realize what, what was what made up that low fat or that all natural product. The ingredients within that product oftentimes was sabotaging their efforts to lose weight or to eat better. Because although, like we'll point out in a minute, and we'll talk a little bit more, this, uh, this is my little prop. Okay, if anybody's eating this yogurt, you don't have to, don't feel guilty. But Yoplait Light, right? This has 100 calories and it's fat free. Pretty good choice, right? Although. You know, that's what it looks like on the, on the shelves in the store. We say, okay, this is a better choice. I always think it's kind of ironic that light is in pretty big words. 100 calories and fat-free is a little bit smaller, but in between those two, it says thick and creamy. So I have to wonder just off the top, how can it be thick and creamy and fat-free and healthy? But see, most people will choose something like this in an effort to better their health, create a better diet, healthier diet. The reality is, this is probably very unhealthy for you compared to the regular yogurt. Well, in fact, it is. Okay? And this will not help you lose weight. It's fat-free, it's light, it's only 100 calories, but yet you'll gain more weight with this than you do the regular yogurt. So I thought it was very important not only to explain to people how much to eat, when to eat, what types of foods, but to explain what's in the foods. And that's what this is all about, part one. Because if I just came out here and said, okay, this is how you devise a healthy uh, diet, healthy meal plan, best times to eat this food, best times to eat that food, this will help you, you know, with your goals. And we didn't talk about what was in the food. You might buy products like this. You may buy products like this. Right? And you're really doing yourself a disservice in terms of what your goal is to eat healthier or lose weight. But also, the ingredients in here, which we'll show you in a minute, are actually toxic for your system. Okay? You know, when we talk about our health care crisis, well, that's why I say you can go 40 days. We're going to be back in 30. Yeah, but anybody here last time for the talk we gave last time? Anybody not here? Okay, some people raise both their hands, so I don't know. <laughs> well, yeah, last time was a little different. Today, it's more of an informational talk. I'm going to give you a lot of information, ammunition, right? So you're ready 
for next time to create a healthier diet. So, no, it's not going to be depressing. It's going to be enlightening. How's that, Robbie? <laughs> okay. It's going to be enlightening. I've got a lot of those in my refrigerator. Well, that's all right. Halloween is coming up. You can give them out. Right? <laughs> so, yeah, today is going to be kind of the nuts and bolts. Okay. Uh, because when you look at our society, okay, and we, we hear these words now, healthcare crisis. You know, we do have a crisis. The main problem is, you know, the people in that White House an hour north of here or so are talking about health care crisis in terms of we need to increase insurance for everyone. We need to make generic prescription medication available to people. Right? That's the thinking that we hear uh, uh, and we read about. The problem is, if that is the type of information that we're focusing on in terms of our health care crisis, that's going to do one thing, make our health care crisis worse. You know, we have a health care crisis. By the middle part of this century, our life expectancy is supposed to decrease by about five years. Right now, it's 77.6 years. Right? It's going to decrease by five years. That's what the estimates are. We have about two-thirds of our adult population is overweight. About 30% of our kids are overweight. Overweight, in terms of kids, the amount of kids that are overweight has doubled in the last 25 years. Diabetes. We see kids, now they estimate kids born in 2000 and on, so the kids that are, you know, were born in 2000, those now, anybody born after 2000 has a 30% chance of becoming diabetic. That's our health care crisis. Now why is that? Is it because of what we eat? Right? We eat more? I'm, I'm, I'm about to do a study in my office, I haven't told patients yet. Uh, it's an oral circumference study. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to measure the circumference of their mouth, right? The oral circumference study, because I want to see if our mouths have increased in size. Maybe that's what I'm thinking. Maybe that's what the problem is, right? See, do you know that <laughs> that's a that's a joke, right? Because this is a lot of information here, so I'm trying to lighten it up. I'm not really going to do that study. <laughs> so, here's the thing, now. What has changed? If you look at genetically over the last 10,000 or so years, our genes have not changed. Okay, our genes have not changed. So why is it that, go back 100, 200 years ago, <coughs> excuse me, I was at a, we went camping at the campfire, so my throat is a little sore, so I apologize. Go back even 100 or 200 years ago, the incidence of heart disease, the incidence of cancers, diabetes, obesity, they didn't exist like they do now. In fact, some of those things hardly existed. And it wasn't because we didn't have the means to diagnose those conditions. It's because they didn't exist. So when you look at people and you say, well, what's changed? Why is it that so many children are overweight? Why is it that there's such an increase in diabetes? Why is it that uh, we spend $500 million a day on heart disease? $470-some million a day on cancer? Why is it that the third leading cause of death is properly prescribed medication? Why is that? It's because of our lifestyle. See, our genes have not changed. So if you look at people 1,000, 2,000, 300 years ago, they lived a very different lifestyle. Most times we say, well, you know, my mom has this, my dad has this, my sister has this, my brother has this, I'm going to have this. Why? Is it the gene? See, genes, genes are just, they are a potential to be something. You don't get those genes for diabetes. There isn't a diabetic gene. There isn't a cancer gene or a heart disease gene that is passed down. See, genes are passed down, but you have the ability to unlock and use the potential within that gene. And that is created by our lifestyle. So when you look at the lifestyle of people, you know, a few hundred years ago, a thousand years ago, it was very different. What did they do? Their, their life was pretty easy. I get up, I hunt, I eat, and I reproduce. Not a bad life, right? Find a nice sized cave and you're happy. Right? Now we live in a very different world. See, our lifestyles have changed. Our genes have not. Our genes have not evolved to allow us to adapt to the new lifestyles that we live in, which is one of chronic stress. 
And it's not just stress, I'm stressed out, but it's the stress that we uh, produce within our bodies. And a lot of that stress is due to what we eat. You know, to become overweight, become diabetic, you have to do one thing. You have to eat the wrong foods or too much of those foods. That's what happens. I was talking to a fellow yesterday, and he just started care, and he was telling me about he, he wants to lose weight. He's having trouble losing the last 30 pounds uh, uh, to reach his goal. And we were talking about his diet, and this, he's a great guy. He has a farm. So everything he eats, I shouldn't say that, the majority of what he eats is grown in his backyard. So we had to talk to him about how much food he ate and, and uh, when he ate those foods, how he exercised. See, that's how we lived years ago. But today, we buy things in a box. We buy things that look healthy and are marketed to be healthy. But the reality is they're not. And that's part of our healthcare crisis. Right? Successful marketing. You know, they spend millions and millions of dollars. They put all these models on TV and the pictures of magazines, and that's what we want to look like. That's what we want to be like. So how do you do that? Well, you buy those products. You know? It was funny, I remember when Michael Jackson did the commercial, was it for Pepsi, I believe, right? Did the Pepsi commercial? He didn't drink Pepsi. And they had to, they had to almost coax him into doing this commercial. Of course, I think it was like $15 million or something. That was pretty good incentive. You know, I'll cross the, but he didn't drink Pepsi. Right? But yet people associated Michael Jackson to Pepsi. The marketing. That was when he was in his heyday, right? We wanted to be like Michael Jackson. People wore the coats and sang the music. So let me buy Pepsi. I'll be more like Michael Jackson. You know, I'm gonna <coughs> I'll be more like the model if I buy this and eat this. The problem is they might not even eat it. <laughs> right? So let's take a look at what's in foods. Because we all know what's healthy. You're eating an apple. We all know the apple's healthy for us. Right? Don't worry, I'm not going to pick on you. But we all know the apple's healthy for us. So if you had in your mindset, in your uh, thought process, that this donut is not healthy. The apple is healthy. But boy, I like those donuts. I really like those donuts. You're sitting on the beach in Duck, and Duck Donuts is down the street. Hot donuts, they dip them in the chocolate. But I know the apple's healthier. But I really want that donut. What are you going to do? You're going to have the donut. Right? Because that's your belief system. That donut is good. I know it's not as good as the apple, but I really want that donut. Problem is, most people don't know how dangerous the donut is for us. We know how healthy the apple is, but we don't understand the consequences associated with eating the donut. Doesn't mean you, you, know, you have to abstain from eating donuts. I have about three or four donuts a year, and that's when I go down the duck. After about three or four days, I, I can't eat the donuts anymore. I just don't feel good but I have the donut, right? But that's not part of my daily routine. So when we look at foods, we have to look at the ingredients. You know, when you read the ingredients of food, we start to read this, and most times we get halfway through, I have no idea what's in this thing. But it's fat-free, it's got 100 calories, and it's light. I'll buy it, it has to be good. So what we've done, we've compiled the list of ingredients that people should know about, you should be very aware of. I see a lot of kids in the office. I see ADD, and I see these kids are constantly sick, hyperactive kids. You know, um, I see adults. Probably the, the people ask me, you must see a lot of people with back pain, neck pain, and certainly we do. But the top three causes or, or reasons why people come in the office, headaches and, uh, headaches and migraines, allergies and digestive problems. Maybe not in that order. And I can adjust people and care for them and help them with their digestive problems. But they constantly put toxic substances in their body, they're going to constantly have these chronic problems. So not only do we have to look at, well, what else can we be doing from a care standpoint? We have to look at what are you putting in your body to change the physiology within yourself. So let's talk about that. First thing we're going to talk about, the first culprit in causing ill health, a product called aspartame. Anybody ever hear of it? Okay, Benevia, NutraSweet, aspartame. Aspartame, they're actually undergoing a change with aspartame. They're changing the name of it. And they're going to call it amino sweet, which sounds healthier. Aspartame, artificial color, uh, flavoring, I mean, artificial flavoring, 
Aspartame or amino sweet? Which one sounds healthier? Amino sweet. Yeah, they're changing the name so it sounds healthier. Aspartame goes by any one of those names. When you sometimes, all you'll see on a label, and I think this one has it, yeah, natural and artificial flavor. Doesn't even say aspartame. Anything artificial flavor, that's aspartame. Sometimes it just says artificial ingredients, aspartame. Now why is aspartame not healthy for us? Aspartame is comprised of three ingredients, two of which are amino acids. Phenylalanine, about 50% of uh, aspartame is made up of phenylalanine. Asparic acid, another amino acid, about 40% in uh, aspartame. And then 10% of uh, aspartame is methanol. You know what that is? Yeah, would you eat that? No. Okay, so now all these ingredients we find in nature and we eat them. The problem is they're not genetically modified. When you eat methanol, when you eat a food source that has methanol in it, it's bound up, it's connected to a fiber. What does fiber do? It passes through us. So very little of that methanol is ever ingested. But yet when we make aspartame, we genetically modify and we put all these ingredients together in a very unnatural state. So now bad stuff can happen because the methanol doesn't pass through. About 100% of the methanol breaks down to formaldehyde. I don't know about you, but I'm not going to give my child a bowl of formaldehyde to eat. But yet when they have aspartame or a product containing aspartame, they're eating formaldehyde. You won't see it on the label, but that's what it breaks down to. Phenylalanine, it's an amino acid. I know this sounds depressing, don't worry. <laughs> I have to go through this stuff with you because next time, again, 40 days, so next time we're going to show you all the healthy food, okay? And the great thing about next time is we're going to make it so easy for you because one of the things that people go through is, okay, this is like 95 cents. How much is the, is the organic one, is the healthy one? You know, I can't afford to go to Whole Foods and eat and buy all my food there. Yeah, I know buying organic stuff is more expensive. We're going to prove to you we have a four-page spreadsheet we're going to give you with all the brand name items. Okay, all the items that you buy in the store, and we're going to show you at Martin's, at uh, Kroger, at Whole Foods, how the natural, truly natural, and a lot of times organic foods, the same, they're like the substitutes for the brand name items, are the same or less money across the board. From cereals to juices and drinks to the meats, the eggs, across the board. So we're going to give you a spreadsheet. Okay? So... 30 days, we'll be back. <laughs> but this is important to understand what's in the food, especially for you and if you have kids. Okay? Phenylalanine. Phenylalanine is, a, is an amino acid. Now, what happens when you have too much phenylalanine or you can't break it down, process and get rid of it like, it, like we would in nature, okay, when it's gen genetically modified, when you have too much of it in your system, it causes a condition in your brain called excitotoxicity. That condition did not exist before they started studying the effects phenylalanine had on the brain. Another reason not to eat it. So, excitotoxicity. The best way I can describe this is this. I have three kids, okay? They're three, five, and seven years old. My wife and I, we take them out to dinner. We sit at a table. We know how to handle them, okay? It's two on three. We're outnumbered, but we can handle the situation. We're sitting at a table, no problem. Now, I take my three kids, and I say, why don't you grab some friends? So we bring some friends along with us. Instead of going to the restaurant, let's go to Chuck E. Cheese. Let's go to Pump It Up. What happens there? Chaos, <laughs> right? Craziness. All of a sudden, the kids are running around. You know, it's not that a controlled environment, right? They are hyperactive. They get crazy. That's what happens in your brain when you have phenylalanine that can't be broken down. It causes, excito it causes excitotoxicity of the brain. It overstimulates the neurons in the brain to fire, boom, 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 boom. So it overexcites your brain. Now we see kids, and we say, oh, it's the sugar that makes them hyperactive. Now, the sugar can, but it's substances like aspartame. I see these kids that are hyperactive, they come in the office, before we even start adjusting them, first thing I ask is, write down what they eat for a week, across the board, you know, the Skittles and this and that. I said, you know what, I can help your child before we even start adjusting them. 
take them off all that stuff. And they start to balance out. Now, excitotoxicity. Um, uh, asparic acid is the second uh, ingredient. When you have too much asparic acid in the brain, it causes things like seizures, strokes. When you have too little, it causes the opposite, things like depression. You ever get a sugar high? Okay, and then what happens? I crash. It's not the sugar. It's the ingredients, the chemicals in that product. It causes hyperactivity, and then boom, you crash. So what happens? You have to have more. Your body starts to depend on those substances to keep you up. Right? And that's what I see with the kids. Look at any child's food. Not in that healthy section. I always think it's interesting because when you go into, uh, remember in Ucrops, they used to have the health food section. It was like this square little area, like a jail cell in the back, right? And you go to the healthy section. I always thought it was ironic that they would even name it that because I would think, if anybody really reads that and they say health food section, I would wonder, well, what is the other section? <laughs> Should I be caught out there? Right? But asparic acid causes changes in brain chemistry. Now, I see this because I, I've seen this with my, my daughter. Okay? She went to a birthday party. And she, uh, in the little party bag there, I don't get over crazy with her. Go ahead, eat the little treats. She started having Skittles. Started eating these Skittles. And probably within about 20, 30 minutes, all of a sudden, she started to get un absolutely out of control. Not running around, but just sitting there crying and shaking. Crying and shaking. Madison, what's going on? What, what's wrong, sweetie? I don't know, Daddy. I don't know. Stop. Settle down. Stop. What, you know, I can't. I can't. After, I don't know, an hour or so, it wore off. The, the effects of it anyway wore off. Man, what was going on? You know, started looking through what she ate, and I'm going through the food, so I started making some mental notes. This happened again. Okay, it was a starburst or something like that. And both times, we're going to talk about the dyes in foods, it was a red uh, candy. But not only was it the dye, it was the coloring agent, it was the flavoring in that, in that food. I'm convinced of it. It changed her brain chemistry. She was out of control. Laying on the ground, it looked like somebody who was going through an epileptic seizure. Okay? Her eyes were somewhere out in space, shaking and all that. So I know for a fact, personally, that this happens. So, aspartame. Stay away from it. Okay, NutraSweet. Been, well, it has many different names. Now, I'm going to go through a couple things here. Okay, people ask me sometimes. I've had a couple of people ask me, "Well, how does this even get on the market? You know, if it's going to cause all these problems, how does it get on the market?" Well, number one, it's not a food, so it doesn't have to pass through the same channels that a food does. It's an ingredient, an additive, so it goes through the back door, and it's such a little amount in the food. How harmful can it be? Right. So, aspartame. There are about 20 million people, they say, that cannot properly break down phenylalanine. Now, if you ever see on the can, side of a can or the food items now, they say this item contains phenylalanine. Because 20 million people, they estimate, rough estimates, if they estimate 20 million people, it's probably a lot more, cannot properly break this down. So right away, you are a candidate for excitotoxicity. Right? So in 1989, the Palm Beach Post reported several recent aircraft accidents involving confusion and aberrant pilot behavior caused by the ingestion of products containing aspartame. In 1995, the FAA indicated over 600 pilot reports of problems of severe and dangerous repercussions in the air after ingesting soft drinks containing aspartame were documented. Uh, some of the side effects were things like seizures, vision loss, memory loss, things like that. Not things that you want to have happen to your pilot. In 1991, the National Institute of Health listed 167 symptoms and reasons to avoid aspartame. In 1992, the United States Air Force issued warnings to their pilots uh, saying that they should avoid aspartame-containing products because they're linked to seizures, vertigo, dizziness, memory loss, and gradual vision loss. This is a dangerous product. It was once on the Pentagon's list of biowarfare chemicals because seizures, memory loss, vision loss. They were going to use this as an agent in warfare. 
And then we see it in our kids' soft drinks, in our kids' foods. People ask me, well, how does this even get on the market? It actually has an interesting story. It's the only one I'm going to go into detail about because I want you to understand how these things pass. So in 1960s, this company, Searle, was the company. They were devising this, uh, this medicine. It was supposed to be for ulcers. And they're coming up with this medicine. It didn't work. It failed. So well, what else can we use it for? Well, every time they put it in the medicine, it made the medicine taste better. So I said, well, let's use it in food. It tastes better, right? So that's what happened. When they put all their information, their studies together, put them uh, across the FAA, I mean the um, uh, FDA, uh, they forgot to uh, include in there some of the studies they did because some of the studies showed that this product caused cancer, caused seizures, memory loss. So once they got a hold of all this inform information, they said, well, maybe this is not a product that we want to put on the market. Let's investigate this a little bit more. So they put it in front of uh, the uh, uh, United States Attorney General. He started investigating this, aspartame. Okay? And what he found was this documentation was correct. But the then uh, president of the board of this company, Donald Rumsfeld, I don't know if you heard of him, he had some political ties. They said, well, let's get this, let's get this passed. Why is it? It's about a billion dollar industry. Okay? Now it's a $4.5 billion industry. Anyway, they, uh, so the attorney general started to put it on hold. So they fired him. So he was looking for a job. He got a job working for the law firm that represented Searle. Okay, once he was prosecuted, now he's now representing him. So a new attorney general was hired. Okay, he started looking at all the information. He was then started to prosecute. He was fired because he put it on the side. He was hired for the, by the law firm that represented Searle. Now the medical director of the FDA stepped in, started looking at all this information. It turns out he got a new job working for the marketing company as a chief medical representative that represented Searle. That's how these things get passed. It's like bizarre. If you read this and you think, this is what goes on, but that's how this product's on the market. That's how unscrupulous these people are. So anyway, the good thing is next time we're going to show you all the healthy food to eat. Remember, right? So that's aspartame. You may look at it and you may find it as, um, like I said, NutraSweet, as um, amino sweet. That's going to be the new name, or just artificial flavoring but it's certainly something to be aware of. The next thing is MSG. MSG is in foods, okay? MSG was made, genetically made, to mimic a substance within seaweed that enhanced the flavor of foods. Was back in World War II, uh, when the troops were eating the Japanese rations, they said, man, this stuff tastes really good. It's better than our stuff. You know, wh what's in this? What was the MSG? It made the food taste better. MSG by itself doesn't have a taste but it enhances the taste of other things. It stimulates part of your senses. So they said, wow, we can make this food taste better. Let's put that in there. You ever go to a Japanese restaurant, Chinese restaurant, where you say, oh, I want you know, chicken kung pao and I want it with no MSG. Why do you get it with no MSG? Uh, I never knew. I just always said no MSG, right? But MSG, there's a, there's a condition called MSG symptom complex. The people that are affected by this are healthy, young, athletic adults. They go into cardiac arrhythmia. When you hear these athletes, you know, Jackie Joyner Curse died of a heart, heart attack, and people always wonder, well, what were they eating? You know, what was their diet comprised of? So MSG is something to, to certainly stay away from, okay? Don't put it in your foods. When you see it, monosodium glutamate, when you see it on the label, that's not healthy. Okay. If the food, because it's been in a box for so long, or been on a shelf so long, it doesn't have the original taste it was meant to have, maybe that food isn't good to eat. Right? Maybe that's why they have to put this in the food. When I go to Whole Foods, um, and we buy like their English muffins or something like that, English muffins from Whole Foods might last about, it might last a week, might. Usually about five days and they start to get moldy. You know, when you buy any type of lunch meat from Whole Foods, it doesn't have any preservatives in it, uh, it doesn't have uh, very low sodium, it doesn't have any, uh, any of that stuff that we find in other lunch meats, it only lasts maybe a week because that's all it was made to last for. 
But see, we put all this stuff in it to make it taste better for longer so it lasts longer so we can sell more of it. And then we wonder, why does this last so long? You know, buy bread from a grocery store. How long does it last? It can last a few weeks. Why is that? Hmm. When some bread goes bad in like a week, they have to make it that way. MSG is something to watch, something to, to look out for. Okay? Now, the next one I like is uh, BHA and BHT. It's interesting. I take care of a couple people from Europe, and they don't allow preservatives and these ingredients in their food like we do here. It's very interesting. They will not import a lot of the foods that we want them uh, to purchase from us because of what's in the food, because of how it's genetically modified. BHA and BHT, they are on the, uh, the FDA's list. It's called the GRASS list. Anybody ever hear of it? I'll explain it to you and put it very easily. This is healthy. Okay, the FDA says, this is healthy. The FDA says, this is not healthy. Okay? Then you have something where this, mm, it's kind of healthy, it's not really that bad, but not it's kind of, it's generally regarded as safe. We'll call it that. It's in the middle. So, <coughs> excuse me, this is not healthy, we're not going to buy it. This is healthy, no problem, green lights. This is genetic, generally regarded as safe. Would you eat that? And generally it's safe. Would you eat it? Probably not if somebody put it in those terms. BHA and BHT are generally regarded as safe. Not really safe, not really bad, but eh, somewhere in the middle. Probably not going to cause too many problems. Right? Gene generally regarded as safe. BHT is not allowed in, in Europe, okay, in England. They do not allow it. What BHA and BHT is, is preservative. Makes things last longer. Okay? Again, if things aren't made to last for more than a week, 10 days, they shouldn't be genetically modified to last two, three, four weeks. That's not healthy for you. Okay? But we try to make the meats look more red, the food look more vibrant, and smell better, so we buy more. You know, if you had red meat sitting here, and you had kind of a grayish brown meat, which one are you going to buy? The red one. It looks better. But maybe it's made to look like that. If you look at what's in foods, in meats, nitrates, okay, these types of products, they put them in to make them look better. Change the color and preserve the fats in the, in the food. There's a reason why the meat lasts so long, or looks more red. You know, if you ever go there, the gray stuff is always on sale. Right? <laughs> why is it on sale? Just because of the way it looks. The red stuff, that's the newer stuff. That's been injected with all the dye and it still lasts. Eventually, though, it's going to wear out. Right? We make it look like that. BHA and BHT. Um, BHT, uh, according to the uh, FDA, they have to still determine if it's safe or toxic. Verdict's still out on that one. But it's generally regarded as safe. Nitrates are another one. It was interesting. The, uh, the uh, meat industry acknowledges that nitrates are not a healthy and good substance to put in foods, but they have not found an alternative at this point. So it's generally regarded as safe. The meat industry said this. I mean, it's a $100 billion a year industry. So they don't want to mess that up. Right? Their job is to make profits for their shareholders. So if they can make things look better, they're going to sell more, even though they know that this substance is not a healthy substance. They haven't found an alternative. I was reading an article somebody brought in to me the other day. It was actually pretty interesting. I don't know if people come in and have seen it. Um, I, I paste it on the wall that uh, the farmers, a lot of farmers, feed cows or, and steers bubble gum, chewing gum, in the wrapper because it increases their, their uh, appetite. So they eat more. There's an article. I researched it, and it's actually true. <laughs> it's bizarre. So, you know, maybe you don't chew gum, but your meat does. <laughs> See? It's not only important to look at what's in food, one of the reasons why I buy our, all of our meat, chicken and meat, organic, because I know what they eat. See, because I'm not only eating that. We look at it and we say, well, I'm eating this piece of meat. Well, that's fine. But what did that piece of meat eat before it was a piece of meat? Because you're eating that too. What was on the ground? What was it sprayed with? What are they walking on? What are they laying on? Right? Don't worry, 30 days, I'll be back. Right? 
Right? So think about food in those terms, too. You know, look at where your food source comes from. So the last thing we're going to talk about before we move on to the sugars are the uh, coloring agents, dyes. Um, by the way, uh, BHT, BHA, they're all um, petroleum byproducts, too. So I don't know if you'd swim in the oil spill in the Gulf, but you eat it with BHA and BHT. I kind of make it sound gross because I want to make a point. Okay? <laughs> coloring agents, they are all uh, made from petroleum. Okay? So in 1938, date, dyes were uh, cleared for use by the FDA in foods. In 1950, the FDA, okay, about 15 years or 12 years after that, the FDA removed orange 1 and 2 and red 32 because it caused illnesses in kids. In 1973, red 1 and 4, yellow 1, 2, 3, 4, and violet 1 were all removed because they were seen to be carcinogenic, cause of cancer. 1976, red 2 was removed because it was seen to cause cancer. However, citrus red was still allowed. Your oranges, your grapefruits, why do they look so orange and red? They inject them with a dye. That dye was removed from food because it was carcinogenic, but they still allow it in citrus food. Why? There's no substitute. So um, red 3 and 40 are possibly carcinogenic, but they definitely cause brain chemistry changes. But they're not being removed from the market at this point because they haven't proven uh, definitely that it causes cancer. Okay. What's interesting is, if you look at the dyes, okay, they found out that in 1950s and 1970s that these uh, substances caused cancer. What are they going to find out in 2015? What are you eating now that they haven't determined is harmful? So my point of view is, I don't eat any of it. Because I don't want to find out in five years the substance they call safe now is not safe, not healthy. If something is supposed to be blue, don't change it to look orange. Anybody ever drink Gatorade back in the 70s? Gatorade, if you looked at it, it was like this really kind of gross looking greenish yellow drink, right? And it didn't taste good at all. Gatorade was designed, it, it, was, it was made by the uh, University of Florida, uh, scientists at the University of Florida, Gatorade, Florida Gators, to help the Gators because of where they play football. South Florida, or, or all their athletes, but mainly the football players, Basically, they perspire and lose all these electrolytes. So they came up with this drink. That drink was designed for high endurance athletes that were losing a lot of their important uh, nutrients. So they came up with this. So then I think it was Coke or Pepsi, I can't remember which one. One of those companies bought Gatorade. And they said, this is a great product. But sadly enough, it has a very small segment of the population that's going to buy it. We need to increase our market share. So what can we do? Well, we can change it from this really ugly greenish yellow to red and blue and orange. Right? Then we can make it taste better. So now you see Gatorade, like my seven-year-old son, he, has to, he, he always wants Gatorade. Now, I buy him vitamin water because it looks the same color and it's healthier, but he needs Gatorade. Right? He's been told by television ads he needs Gatorade because he's an athlete. Because of the amount of electrolytes and nutrients that he loses on a daily basis playing the hard core sports that he plays, you know, when he's in the outfield chasing the butterflies and the bugs and all this stuff, he needs to replenish this stuff. So Gatorade. They market this to the kids and adults, but we think that substance is healthy for us because athletes drink it. But why is it those colors? Why does it taste so good? If you tasted the original Gatorade, you wouldn't think it's so good. I remember tasting it years ago. I'm like, this is absolutely disgusting. <laughs> right? <coughs> right? This is before everybody was on TV advertising it. But it's made that way. It's designed that way. It's marketed that way, so we buy it, and we buy a lot of it. Right? So the last thing we talk about, sugars. Okay, sugars. Now sugar gets a bad name. Okay, glucose, fructose. We, th we always hear this fructose. Stay away from fructose, right? right? Especially people go on diet, and fructose is the bad thing. Okay. Now sugar, when we have sucrose, okay, and we eat, we eat sugar, okay, and we have a certain amount of glucose that we're eating, Glucose stimulates two important ingredients. It stimulates something called leptin, okay, which increases leptin. And when we eat a lot of glucose, leptin is increased. It goes to the brain. It says, stop eating this substance. We're done. We've had enough. Cessation of appetite. It also, as a double check, it depresses 
or suppresses ghrelin from being released in the stomach. So ghrelin then goes to the brain and says, hey, our levels are getting low. Stop eating the sugar. We don't need it anymore, glucose in particular. So glucose, you can't eat too much. Your body will shut off. Okay? But now fructose doesn't have that same safeguard. Because why? Fructose, fruit sugar, is normally in fruit. It's bound up with pectin. It passes through us. We don't absorb it. It doesn't float around in the body. You won't eat too much of it because it passes through. How many apples are you going to eat at one sitting? One, maybe two. You're not going to overeat it. But now, we can genetically modify the glucose and the fructose, put it together, bind them together, take out the pectin. Now, we have high fructose corn syrup. Now, what happens to the fructose? Right? The glucose gets stored in the liver, whatever we don't use right away. Some of it passes through, some of it gets stored in the liver so that we have energy for later. It pulls it out and says, hey, let's, we need our energy stores increased, so you pull more glucose out. But the fructose, right, over 35 to 40 percent of the fructose is stored as fat because we can't do anything with it. It's not passing through us. We can't absorb it properly, break it down, and utilize it. So let's keep it. Let's hold on to it because we don't know what else to do with it. High fructose corn syrup, okay? When you see this, zero fat calories, the second ingredient in this is high fructose corn syrup. So translated to, second ingredient is about 35 40% fat. But yet this is fat free. I was talking to the fellow who's the farmer, like I mentioned, he's eating all this fat free stuff. And he can't lose any weight. I said, eat the regular stuff, you will lose weight. We had to change other things, but this wasn't helping them. So, high fructose corn syrup is in just about everything. High fructose corn syrup is in soft drinks, in the, anything, pretty much anything in a box, right? Because it's very cheap, and it tastes. The, it's, the, it's the sweetener, you know, the high fructose corn syrup. It's a sweetener. It's even sweeter than sugar. Right? So it's sweeter than sugar, it's cheaper than sugar, let's use it. During Nixon's era, that's when high fructose corn syrup started being used. He had the war on poverty, he said nobody will go hungry while I'm in office. No matter how bad our economy is, no one will go hungry. Let's make food cheaper. How do we do that? Let's put stuff in it that we can make to make it taste better. People will eat more, helps the economy, and they can afford it. And that's how high fructose corn syrup came to be. Right? High fructose corn syrup. So it's about a third of the cost of, of sucrose, right? table sugar, 20 times sweeter. Sugar consumption <coughs> per year, about 141 pounds per person. High fructose corn syrup, just high fructose corn syrup, about 63 pounds per person a year. About 35, 40 percent, somewhere around there, turns the fat. Since 1970, high fructose, high fructose corn syrup in our diets has increased by 10,000 percent. Adolescents have about 12 percent of their totally, total, daily, uh, total daily calorie intake comprised of high fructose corn syrup. That's the equivalent of about 73 grams a day of not products that contain it, but high fructose corn syrup itself. And we wonder why our kids are now obese. We wonder why they have the diabetes. If fructose can't be absorbed, it's not being excreted. It's got to float around somewhere. More sugar in the blood. Diabetes. Right? That's why we have a health care crisis. Nobody understands this stuff. So what do we do? We treat diabetes. We do more research. We have runs and walks that are great. But we're putting more money in perpetuating that cycle. Simply take this stuff out of foods. Teach people how to eat better. And you won't have heart disease as the number one cause of death. You won't have diabetes as the number six or seven cause of death. Right? Then you would probably not have the third cause of death, which is properly prescribed medication, because people wouldn't need to take the medication because it'd be healthier. But we rely on the medication because we're not healthy. Why do you have to control your insulin? Control your diet. Then you don't have to worry about your insulin. Right? So, we all know the apple is healthy. We all know the donut tastes really good. 
but most people don't understand the effect of the donut on our body. I'll share with you one more thing. This is not depressing enough. I was thinking about it. I was reading an article uh, about a food company. And somewhere in the article, uh, it just popped up that the food company was owned by a cigarette company. And I was thinking about it. I'm like, I wonder what ingredients they put in a cigarette. Just by chance, I said, let me look. Marlboro Box 100s, OK? Tobacco and water. The third ingredient, high fructose corn syrup. Then you go down to artificial flavorings, aspartame, and a bunch of other bad stuff I won't get into. High fructose corn syrup was the third ingredient, and then aspartame. So then I said, hmm, I wonder what companies this company owns. So then I started looking at Wrigley's Orbit, Orbit Peppermint Gum. It has sorbitol, sugar, artificial flavors, aspartame, later on down the list, BHT, and it also contains uh, a lot of other unhealthy things, right? But gum, chewing gum, if you can change one thing, change the gum you eat because it goes into your salivary glands, gets right into your bloodstream, goes to your brain a lot faster than food that has to be processed through your whole GI tract. Kellogg's Super, uh, Kellogg's Spider, uh, Spy, Kellogg's Special K Blueberry Bar. Okay, Special K, we see the K and then what, the lady in that white bathing suit like this? <laughs> Healthy, right? So Special K uh, Blueberry Bar. So, uh, this first ingredient is sugar, and then we go to high fructose corn syrup, and then fructose, uh, vegetable oil, BHQ, which is similar to BHT, BHA, artificial flavors, sorbitol, and again, down the line, BHT. And this is a product that's healthy for us. Now, I have kids, right, who brush their teeth. Why do they brush their teeth? What do you say? Got to get all the stuff off your teeth. You, you, drink, you had a donut. You had something to drink that had sugar. So brush your teeth. Get all that sugar out, right? Sugar causes cavities. So I thought, let me look up uh, toothpaste. Kids Colgate, toothpaste and mouthwash. The first ingredient, sorbitol, that's sugar, right? Then we have dyes, saccharin, which is carcinogenic, no questions there, flavor, which is aspartame, blue dye, yellow dye. And I'm thinking, this is what my kids are going to brush their teeth with, right? <laughs> now we have healthy toothpaste that doesn't have that in it. But it was kind of ironic that the toothpaste has probably more sugar than the foods they're eating to clean their mouth, to clean out of their mouth. It's bizarre. To I me, mean, it's bizarre. Why is the toothpaste blue? Why is it red? Why does it taste so good? Right? If I buy Tom's of Maine toothpaste, it tastes like baking soda. Right? But this stuff is very unhealthy. And here we're, we're you know, telling the kids to brush your teeth with it. So. I know it was like, wow, this is pretty heavy. Like I said, you can go 40 days without eating. 40 days, we're going to be back in 30. So you will be alive. Look at, look at the foods. You know, look at the ingredients in the foods. Read the ingredients. Like I said, 100 calories, fat-free, you'll play light. The second ingredient is high fructose corn syrup. And then as you go down, it has Splenda, which is, Splenda is great. Tastes like sugar made from sugar with zero calories. Splenda, right? Yeah, not good. Because it's genetically modified. They put glucose and fructose together. They only did one study on this. They had 34 people in the study. You know what they evaluated the people for over a two week period of time? In two weeks. Does this product cause any problems to the gums or teeth? Over two weeks. No, it didn't. Okay, great, let's use it. Well, what were y'all talking about before? <laughs> Tell them what to eat. What was the sugar you were talking about? Stevia? Right. Next time we meet, we're going to give you a whole list of, of uh, healthy sugar and sweeteners. Okay? But there are a lot of choices out there that are healthy. Yeah. But like... <laughs> I've been asked so many times, can you go shopping with us? <laughs> but something like this, high fructose corn syrup, Splenda, artificial flavoring, and then dyes. But yet we're having this because it's marketed as healthy. 
So see, it's not only what you eat, it's what's in the foods that you eat. And what was that food eating before it was your food? It can be very overwhelming. The easiest thing is, stay on the perimeter of the grocery store. Don't go in the middle. If it has an expiration date of like nine months or a year, probably not good. Right? If you look at our ancestors, what did they eat? Anything that grew from a tree, grew from the ground, or walked on the ground. Every food they ate was organic. Period. There was nothing else available for them. Our genes are the same as theirs. Why do we get sick? We don't live the way they did. You know, when you talk about our lifestyles, the chronic stress we live with, stress is made to keep us alive. Stress was, I come out of my cave, there's a lion. Holy cow, I need to run. Get away from the lion or I will be eaten. So you have a stress response to keep you alive. What happens after you're out of harm's way? The stress goes down. I go back to hunting, eating, and reproducing. Life is good. What do we do? My life is stressful. My job is stressful. I only have 20 more years to retirement, so you're going to live with that stress for 20 years. Right? We live with chronic stress. If our genes are the same as they were 10,000 years ago, and those people were healthy, had lean body mass, why is it we're unhealthy? If we only ate food that came out of the ground off a tree or walk along the earth in a healthy environment, we would be healthy. This fellow was telling me, yeah, should I stop eating the, um, he had uh, pork, right? He was saying, yeah, someone told me I eat, you know, he eats pork maybe once a week, a couple times, a few times a month. I said, no, don't worry about the pork. It comes from your backyard, right? You leave it out for a little while, it's going to spoil. He cuts the fat off of it. See, it's not the pork. It's what's in the pork. I eat buffalo meat. It's great. Right? It's all natural, organic. I eat chicken. It's all natural, organic. I eat eggs. I don't worry about the cholesterol in the eggs. We need cholesterol. Your brain needs cholesterol. Stay alive. Right? It's where the cholesterol comes from. What's put in the food to keep it a, you know, looking good, smelling good, and not spoil, that's the problem. See, people are so caught up in fat-free and sugar-free and all this stuff. Right? You have to look at what's in the food. And also, the ingredients in the food, that when broken down, those ingredients become. That's a key. So, hopefully this has not depressed you, but impressed upon you the importance of a healthy diet. Because we want to live long, healthy lives. I can ask that question, everybody's hand is going to go up. My question is, what are you doing to produce that? What are you doing to get way past 77.6 years to 120 years when our genes are meant to divide and, and grow and live healthy? That's what our genes, our, our cells rather. Cells are meant to divide and, and stay alive for over 120 years. But we're like half of that, 76 years, and decreasing. So the choices you make today are going to impact you today, tomorrow, and 20, 30 years down the line. The great thing is, if you change your lifestyle consistently for up to three years, it's as if your body has been doing that, living that lifestyle since day one. So it doesn't matter where you are now, it matters where you're going to be in 20 years based on the choices you make now. now like I said, I go down to, to Duck, saw Jay down there, and First day, I go pick up Duck Donuts. They're hot, chocolate sprinkles. My daughter has the rainbow sprinkles, the pink rainbow sprinkles. Right? Right? But after about three or four days, I don't even feel good eating it. Like my body just, you know, I have it. I get over. So it's not that I deprive myself of all those things. Not that I deprive myself of the kids, of, of being able to go to the birthday party and have the snacks. But I watch them, and I watch what they eat. They don't always know that. You know, why is there not as much candy as there was yesterday? I don't know. Michael must have eaten it. <laughs> Mommy had it. <laughs> right? Halloween is like, God, I had the big bag. I don't know. <laughs> the dog ate it. We don't have a dog, but maybe it's a neighbor. But, you know, you be realistic with your lifestyle, but understand what produces health. It's your choice, and you, it's not your genes, it's not your mom or your grandmother that passed this along. Maybe it's because you all have the same lifestyle. Maybe it's because you're doing the same thing they were doing, but yet you want a different result? Doesn't always work that way.
change your lifestyle, change your choices, you'll have different results. So Kim has a packet of information on your way out. You can pick it up. It has uh, pretty much most of the, if not all of the information that we talked about. See, the information is important, but the tools, that's what we provide for you, are really important. You put that to use and you make small changes, just little ones. And then cumulatively, those little ones will count up and add up to big changes. If anyone's interested um, in coming to the office to learn more about this or you know, learn more about what we do in terms of chiropractic care and how that affects your overall health, uh, certainly we make that available to you as well. And Kim can talk to you about that uh, for you or your families. Or if you have folks outside of this area that you feel this information or even chiropractic can be beneficial for, let me know. We'll find someone for them in their area that has similar philosophies and tools uh, as we do. So I thank you for your time. We'll be back at the beginning of November. Don't stress out. Don't become a vegetarian and just eat. <laughs> well, that might not be bad. So I appreciate your time. If anyone has any questions, let me know. Uh, next time, like I said, we're going to pass out a lot of information. You'll be having the packets passed out before. We'll follow through. And we'll really talk about how to put together a healthy diet. Now you know what's in the food. Now it's easy. And you know what foods to buy. Now it's putting it all together and creating a healthy diet. And we're going to help you with that next time. So I appreciate your time, and I thank you for coming. Thank you.